everybody, welcome back to Comic Bin Bandits. I'm your, one of your hosts, Oren Phillips, along with my buddy Joe Marcello. And today we have a comic book legend, the man, the myth, the guy whose name has been in more comic books than we can even imagine, George Gene Gustines. George, thank you so much for joining us. Nice to be here, gentlemen. That is so yeah. cool. I want to start off with that because you have been... If anyone who's collected DC Comics in the 80s probably has at least one comic in their collection that has a letter from you on it, how did that get started? How did you, you know, just get so passionate enough to say, like, I want to just keep sending these letters in? Uh, I was thinking about this recently. I think, I think kids today don't realize how hard it was to be a comics fan when we were growing up. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it was something to be... I'm not sure if ashamed is the right word, but like you couldn't be <laughs> out about it back then. Right. Like yeah. my parents definitely didn't like me spending money on this stuff. And when I started reading comics, I realized that I had no one to talk to about them. And I was right. a big Titans fan. So I had heard about a Titans fan club. So my first letter to the editor was asking whether that club still existed. Uh, and at the bottom of that letter, I said, if there are other DC fans out there who want to be pen pals, like write me. And I think right. the New York city address uh, helped attract people to writing me. And that sounds creepy. I, I don't mean it like, <laughs> like I was being groomed or anything. It just meant I'm glad like, you're okay. Yeah. Like, Oh yeah. Like the Titans existed in New York city. I lived in New York city. I think right. it, it, it helped uh, get fans to write me. And uh, yeah, it was, it sort of took off from there. Was that your window into your current work? Is that uh, how you kind of parlayed that into your, your career? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I look at it that way. It certainly wasn't planned, but when I joined Titan Talk, which was the fan club that I was asking about, um, it, was, it, was a, it was a bi-monthly fanzine. Uh, so it sort of trained me to write about comics more because we, you know, we were talking about the latest issues some people were um, writing stories or drawing uh, Titan stories. I tried that, I was terrible at both. Um, so like the commentary was something I was pretty good at. Uh, and yeah, you can definitely trace a line from there to my writing about comics later on. You got to the times, how hard was it for you to pitch a story about comic books when you first started? Was it, was it sort of just shrugged off? Or it's the same sort of thing where like I was not out as a comics fan uh, right. and I didn't I didn't think you know I just it was sort of an after school job for me I didn't think I was going to be a reporter or anything I was literally there to like run errands and make Xeroxes um, and I wrote a piece about comics in 2002 um, and I was sheepish about it like I knew we needed we had a shopping column. We were desperate for a story one week. And I told one of the editors, like, listen, when we travel, my husband always tries to find a comic book store for me because I hate flying. I hate leaving New York City. And this is how he suckers me into going anywhere. <laughs> and she said, yeah, that's a shopping column because there were like international stores. There were some stores in California. Uh, and that DC noticed that story and then gave me my first news story. And that sort of it snowballed from there. You know, we've had a lot of comic discussions in the past, usually by, by text, but um, what I've, I've wanted to ask you this for uh, at least a month now, um, it's not necessarily old comics related, but it, it is uh, old comics adjacent. So what is your take on the current state of the comic world, um, meaning, you know, it seems like uh, certainly with DC, it's it's always it's ever changing. You know, there's always a crisis. There's always a major event happening that tends to reboot and rechange uh, the status quo. You know, they went from Doomsday Clock, which kind of segued into heavy metal or dark metal, and then then again, which then led into future state, which, you know, one big thing. Um, what, what's your take on all that? I mean, 
it was interesting because after Dan DiDio left, I, I wasn't sure what direction uh, any of this would go in. They seem to have like that, uh, I guess the, the five years, the 5G plan yeah. uh, was rumored that they were going to sort of, I think, jump ahead a few years. Uh, all these uh, new legacy heroes would be around. Um, I mean, some of them sounded interesting, but I was also worried that once he left, that there would be nobody to sort of steer the ship. Mm -hmm. um, the future state stuff, I'm, I guess I shouldn't say this, but I'm really, I'm really happy at how good most of those books have been. Mm -hmm. um, because like, I mean, we all lived through convergence and those books were not as good as these. Um, and a lot that of the clearly a filler, it seemed like some, like we need to put something in between here and our next big event. And that was convergence. Right. Right. And, you know, and maybe a future state is a condensed version of a uh, 5g. So they were able to like compress and, and pick out the best concepts. But I, I was shocked at how strong so many of the books were like, the Robin book was great. The Justice League book is excellent. Yeah. Um, I'm a Titans fan, so I'm really bitter. Uh, and that book is really good, even though I'm still angry at the treatment of some of the characters. So to the, and this is the one I really wanted to ask you about. Uh, Dick Grayson and his uh, look, meaning kind of Nightwing slash Deathstroke. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it works in that story. It's, it's yeah. fun. Like, he has a different look in the Nightwing book. I mean, that would probably be my one uh, quibble about this. I, like, I'm not sure how the timelines completely line up here. Yeah. He has his solo book. He's, uh, I think he's called, like, what, uh, Nightstroke or something? Or uh, <laughs> I think yeah. that happened to my grandmother. Deathwing. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, so, I, I, yeah, I, I, I think he looks... It's an interesting costume and it's an interesting concept. Yeah, no, it was cool. And, you know, I know uh, your attachment to Titans, I really wanted to get your opinion on it, but it just, you know, it's, um, it gets a bit frustrating because you have, um, I've always found that for jumping off points, DC has been a bit more, uh, has been easier to do that. Where not that, you know, you can't do that with Marvel, but Marvel is really, so much more grand in their storytelling and that you know even if you do they do have a reboot and there's a jumping off point like they did with uh house of x or I'm, i've got the title wrong but you really need to catch up with a lot of other titles to really get the full gist of what's going on so i don't you know i remember you know collecting comics as far back as 92 and with the exception of Crisis on Infinite Earths, I don't remember there being so many reboots um, as there are nowadays. Every few years, there's something rebooted. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, I think Marvel tends to do a better job of putting their events in, in sort of uh, in special books. They don't necessarily uh, go into the monthly book. Um, so like, if you, wanted, if you wanna read the whole event, you can, but if you're reading a particular uh, series, it won't necessarily be interrupted by the crossover. Thanks. Yeah, one thing I wanted to ask you was, you know, you write for the New York Times, you, you, you've been on, you know, all sorts of um, issues and stuff like that. What you say, your opinions, what you profile and stuff has a lot of sway in the comic book industry with fans and stuff like that. Um, how do you balance that responsibility? Do you ever feel to yourself like, I don't want to be too hard on this book. I don't want to bury this thing. But at the same time, I, I have to be honest. Or do you just try to focus on the positives as, okay, I really enjoyed this. Let me focus on this. I mean, I, it's a little bit easy for me because these days I'm, I'm primarily covering news. So mm -hmm. like, I, I don't need to have an opinion about it, thankfully. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, it, it, it is what it is. I'm just telling uh, people what's happening. Uh, earlier in my career, when I was doing reviews, I was criticized for not being more critical of books. Uh, but I felt like with limited space, why would I, and this was before like comics were totally embraced. Like, why would I devote any space to a book I didn't like when I, when I could write a, about a book I did like and hopefully get other people to read it? Makes sense. Yeah, it just seems like, you know, like anything else, it's very subjective. So what, you know, 
one person thinks is, you know, garbage, for lack of a better term, someone else may really enjoy. So, you know, there's no sense in tearing someone down to bring others up in that sense. Right. Now, what are some older books, you know, because, you know, with our show, we talk a lot about stuff you'll find in dollar bins, older comics, stuff like that. What are some like hidden gems that might be out there that people, you know, might pass over now, but should probably take a look at and see uh, what it's all about? Oh, that's a good question. I wish I had prepared for that one. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I mean, like, are we are we talking a particular time frame? Like, just like you know, some right? some, uh, let's say '80s comics that you know maybe didn't get the fanfare of some of the bigger names, but were still really solid books. I mean, you guys are usually talking have talked about Atari Force, and I mm-hmm. remember the comics that were part of the games. But yes. I don't think I ever read the DC series, and now mm-hmm. I'm I'm always tempted to read that. There was there was one short story I remember because it was it was reprinted in one of those like best of the year digests right. um, about one of the, like the Atari Force creature. I don't even know what he's called, but he's mm-hmm. being um, he's being uh, stalked by this little robot that just keeps coming back no matter what he does to them. It was a great story by Keith Giffen and it sort of makes me want to read that entire series because it also has Jose Luis Garcia it's Lopez. Lopez. Right? Yeah. Yep. Can't yeah, go wrong with him. It. Yeah, it's, it was a book, like when I first saw it, I thought it's just a shill for the games, but it's really not. It's just a well-written book that happened. They try to tie it in, I guess, to make a little extra money off of Atari. And do you remember, I, I remember those comics, those mini comics, I think, they came with a couple of games. And with really glossy paper, right? The yep. production yep. values were great. Yeah, they put some time and effort in those. Yeah, kind so of like, did you uh, buy those? I had them when I had my Atari. Um, and then I, my parents sold off my Atari, the comics went with them. But I've seen them on eBay. I think you can get like three of them for like 40 bucks or something like that. I wasn't even aware those things existed until probably about four years ago. I was like, oh, did you ever get the comics that went with him? Like, no. And, you know, I'm thinking like, well, I mean, I know He-Man had the comics and those were pretty amazing, but I knew nothing about our Atari comics. Well, that's like Valiant put out comics uh, for Nintendo. I think before they started off, you know, with the Solar Man, the Atom, stuff like that in the early 90s, it was, you know, uh, Super Mario and uh, Zelda and stuff like that. And those are kind of in high demand now, but I guess you got to start somewhere. I can't recommend them. I've never read them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always tempted to read like comics from the 50s and 60s just because they're mm-hmm. so goofy and like and the checker box design on the covers like any cover that has that I, I'm halfway sold already that I'm going to enjoy the story. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I've read some, what was the one I read not too long ago? Uh, Inferior Five from the 60s and that was yeah. kind of a, a cool concept of the the children of you know, superheroes and they don't really want to be heroes, but they keep finding themselves being pushed in the situation to be groomed to be them. I don't think it lasted too long, but it was a cool concept. Yeah, I think that's a concept that's been recycled over and over again through yeah. various either shows, movies, books. Uh, I think it's even in some of my kids' stuff that they watch. But um, yeah, it's a good it's a good uh, thread to have through a uh, mm-hmm through a story. Um, George, I wanted to ask you, we had, a, we had, and we will have them on again because we have to re-record it. Um, <laughs> we, um, uh, Jason Mink, uh, we spoke to him and he was, you know, he's a staunch old guy uh, for old comics person. And, you know, he really seems to, he tapped out about when Death of Superman happened, which is about when I jumped on. Huh, and started okay. collecting is there or what what was your starting or your out point in comics at any point uh starting point i always use justice league 200 as like the comic that made me a collector and a fan because i definitely read comics before that mm-hmm. but that's the one that i just kept going back to and like every time i sold my collection and bought it back that's the issue that I always end up buying again. So I've probably bought that issue like 10 times in the last 40 years because I'm stupid and I always sell my collection and then I want that back. Do you really? You actually sell your collection? 
I mean, like probably two or three, probably two times majorly where I had all these comics. I thought I'm done with this. I'm going to get rid of them all. And then I regret it like six months later. Got it. When the, like Joe was saying before with the death of Superman and the early nineties, when you start seeing, you know, everything's polybagged or the foil covers or this, all this different stuff is coming out as a fan. Was that just part of, you know, the landscape or that were you turned off by it or was it just sort of, I mean, I was excited by that stuff. The mm -hmm. death of Superman was definitely uh, like the times wrote about it. Again, I wasn't out about being a fan at that point, but the times right. wrote about it. The times wrote about North star coming out. I saw a DC versus Marvel comic on the desk of a style editor. And I'm thinking like, what is that? I hadn't even heard about that comic. And like, are we possibly going to write about it? Um, yeah, I was a sucker for most of that stuff. I mean, Batman's back breaking, Wonder Woman being replaced, Spider-Man being replaced. Uh, yeah, it's sort of like, give me, I mean, I, I shouldn't say this because I don't like these big events now, but back then it's like, yes, give me all these events. Well, it was all, you know, again, they didn't happen often. So when they did happen, you took notice. Right. And, you know, the, fr the th fact that, you know, Bruce Wayne wasn't Batman. What, what do you mean? That's that's crazy. And now people are I would say people are clamoring for the new for a new Batman, which is why the new future state Batman was kind of caught on so well. Plus, it's, you know, the character has some history and works well into you know, I think the lore of Batman uh, versus say like just Azrael being some guy that Bruce Wayne thought can fight really well. But that's my take on it. No, I think you're right. They, they, set, up, they set up the character for success much better this time. It, just, yeah. it feels a bit more organic than past replacements of superheroes. Yeah. Well, we had a... a question sent in from uh, one of our super fans of the show uh, Ali Tarantino <laughs> oh boy he, to ask you what's your favorite legion of substitute heroes members oh, members so I can I can pick more than one go crazy George this is your show <laughs> oh that's funny uh I for, for some reason color kid is the one that comes to mind first maybe because he looks like a, a pride flag I'm not sure <laughs> Uh, but they were also bizarre. There's a great DC Comics Presents issue where Superman teams up with the subs and they have the most bizarre members. Like one of them, his whole power is that he has two heads. Uh, and it's just like, that's it. He can't do anything else. So he's no help on the Avenger, but he's a member of the team. See that? I never, Legion Comics, I see them. I, I just never, they never hooked me in any way. But you see... I mean, it's it's a Legion comic, but it's a DC Comics Presents comic. Right. It's Keith Giffen in his prime, and okay. it's got Ambush Bug, and so it's it's a very funny issue. I would I would highly recommend that one. Right. And that one was probably in the dollar bins somewhere. I'm sure it is. <laughs> yeah, I was the few comics I've read with Ambush Bug. He's pretty funny in that I would say you know like a cleaner version of like a Deadpool, in that you know a lot of quips and smart ass remarks and things like that. Good stuff. Now I wanted to ask, um, apparently you have some type of uh, fandom relationship, uh, what have you with George Perez? Uh, yes, that's because of Titan Talk. That was your friend. question, I'm sorry, I'm stealing, stealing it. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, all, it all leads back to that letter in Titan Talk. Um, uh, Perez and Wolfman were both members of the fanzine. Okay. Uh, and he in particular, George Perez in particular, was very open to hearing from fans. Like he had his phone number printed in the fanzine. Uh, so at, at one point, I, I'm going to call him. And I called him and I was basically like shaking like an idiot for a half hour because I could not believe I was talking to him. Uh, and he's like, he's such a nice guy super positive and for like a half hour i would call him maybe like once a month once every five weeks and you would just get like a half hour it was like a, a recording of like dc news like he would just tell you everything he was working on um and yeah and it was awesome and he's a super nice guy i got to meet him 
uh, we went to his house in Queens, uh, some of the members, uh, and he showed us pages from the, uh, uh, Games was the graphic novel that came later from, so he showed us pages from Who is Donna Troy when he was, no, no, I'm sorry, it was Games. Games got delayed, so he showed us pages that he was working on back then. And of course, it didn't get published until like 20 years later. Mm -hmm. But yeah, awesome, man. I was very, very sad when he announced his retirement. Well, also through that, he put you into a few of his drawings and that sort of started a trend with you popping up in certain comics. Uh, first time you saw your name or a likeness in a comic book, what kind of rush was that like? I mean, it was crazy. It wasn't a surprise though, because when he did his creator-owned property, Crimson Plague, Mm -hmm. He reached out to all his fans because he wanted all the characters based on real people. Okay. So he said, like, send me photos. And like the more theatrical they are, the more likely that you'll get a bigger role. Mm -hmm. I sent a very basic photo to saying, hey, like, if you put me in a corner, like, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> so he named one of the heroes after me. And I, I'm on the cover of number one or a poster for issue one. Um, and he also got my name into a letter on Raven's nightstand in a Teen Titans issue. That's awesome. That's cool. And it's continued from there. I mean, you were in uh, uh, Archie, was it? Yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been super lucky uh, that a lot of creators have put me into uh, their comics. I was in Wonder Twins, uh, in Archie, in an issue of Daredevil. Uh, the Action Comics 1000, I have a little cameo in, so... Uh, Do you really? Yeah, yeah. I can see my copy from here. I'm going to check it out. So. Yeah, uh, Jerry Ordway uh, snuck me into uh, a scene in the Daily Planet. Very cool. That's insane, man. It, I, I can't believe it. I, I, I'm, I'm stunned whenever I think about it. So what was it that drew you to Titans, that series so much? Because I know that's like, you know, your pride and joy. What was it about the story? What was it about the art, the, the, the team itself? I think, I think, I mean, it, it was Perez's yeah. art that drew me in because I went from Justice League to Titans uh, and then the characters. I mean, I grew up on Robin with, because of reruns of Batman 66. Um, I love the dynamic of the team. Like they were young heroes trying to find their way in the world um and it, it just like it just grabbed my attention and like even now god i think it's almost 40 years later I, i'm still slightly obsessed with the characters they seem to be one of few groups at least within dc that have grown both physically and um you know like just you know as a character because, uh, you know, you have Robin who went to Nightwing and, you know, various incarnations and Donna Troy to Wonder Girl and she was even Wonder Woman for a little while. And you, they, you know, both literally and figuratively, they grew. Uh, they evolved as characters. So like anyone following them, I think that's that's pretty unique. And there's a certain amount of, you know, you're, you're starting off with characters on the ground floor and following them through their quote unquote career. Um, so there, I think it's, you know, there's something to be said about that. You don't see that with many other characters, you know, Superman is Superman, you know, he's been 30 years old, pretty much from, you know, his inception till now, for the most part, same with, you know, Batman and, you know, dare I say many, you know, Marvel characters. So, um, you know, they're unique in that sense. I think Young Justice uh, was on the same track as them. You know, they were started off as Young Justice and then, you know, they ended up being Titans and or some variation thereof. So as a fan, I think that's pretty, uh, it's pretty cool to follow. And I wonder why Marvel doesn't have that problem. I guess it's because they don't have as many sidekicks to their big guns, but I mean, I love the sidekicks. I love the Titans, but that's also leads to a lot of problems for DC because as the sidekicks get older, of course, their mentors are getting older. And that's something that DC doesn't really know how to confront. Like you can't have Nightwing keep aging because that makes Batman that much older. 
Right. No, they had, uh, I think in one of the death of Batman, there was an issue uh, where they had like the, the family picture and they had, you know, Batman, Nightwing, Tim Drake, uh, Jason Todd and Damien. And, you know, they're like all arranged. And, you know, for the most part, they all look the same as one another, just different heights and, and you know, hairstyles are slightly different, but they all are variations of Bruce Wayne in some way or another. And then there's Alfred, the bald, you know, old guy. Right, now that's the terrible part. As the timeline compresses, it just seems like he should not be allowed to have a partner because they're like injured or killed every two years. Yeah, but you know, he doesn't want to, see now we're just, now we're being critical. <laughs> <laughs> but he always works alone, you know, but he's got the biggest bat family of any, uh, any character out there. I know you and I have talked about it, you know, we uh, text each other, but what do you think of Titans, you know, taking from the page to the screen? How do you think they've been doing with that the first two seasons? You know, again, as a Titans fan, I sort of like, I always uh, enjoy the positive parts and try to uh, not focus on the negative parts. You mean, I mean Batman? I mean, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> seeing Hawk and Dove live action is pretty amazing. Uh, Wonder Girl in that show is fantastic. Um, some of the other stuff, like, I, I think we've talked about this, where that Robin in that show is not Robin. He was like, he was written with Jason's personality. He has Tim's uh, gear and he has Dick's name. It was just right. a weird mix of the character. Right. Do you Hopefully he'll be nicer when he's fully Nightwing in the next season. Right. I mean, you do see that there, there is hope for the show, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and like there were so many high points. I mean, mm -hmm. I got a live action Aqualad, too. It's just, I'm never going to complain about seeing all these Titans. Uh, and Crypto. And crypto, yeah, and Super yeah. Bowl. That Super Bowl right. was excellent. Yeah. No, I, I I love the show. I mean, I I remember you and I talking that I was I don't want to give away spoilers, but uh, Donna Troy's uh, end of season two, I thought right. a bit much, but yeah, look, the show's been out for over a year. If anyone <laughs> hasn't watched it now. I don't want to mess with that guy's life. The guy who didn't see it who's watching this, and he's gonna say, damn you, Warren, keep your fat trap shut. <laughs> watch it you know leave comments let me know what you think but i i had a big issue with it and, but i've gotten over it people i'm fine now well look as we all know it's comic book world so people don't stay dead this is true up oh, see now you just ruined it right but yeah, I, mean, I wasn't talking about her i wasn't oh, exactly was, yeah. <laughs> there was any number of people in that series that died I, I will avoid saying what happens, but that was also my problem with it, where they they did something, but then they gave an immediate out. So right. it's like, why even do this? Yeah, right. Well, that's a good point. Now, I want to know, because I consider you and Allie, two of the kings of comics in my world, when you're going through dollar bins, I know you're just in Florida, you, you put out a post that you're looking through dollar bins. What are the things you look for? Like, what, what are the things that you want to find in there to catch your eye? I mean, these days, because I'm egotistical, I'm looking for <laughs> comics that have my letters in them because I want to have a complete set. Right. Um, How far are you that, from that? What's that? How far are you from getting a complete set? I probably have a third of them, and that's mostly because Allie gave me a nice stack of them. Nice. Wow. Um, I'm really just looking for like whatever catches my eye, and I, I'm, I mainly shop for my fellow nerds. So like, if I know they're looking for something... Like mm -hmm. that gives me something to shop for because I do try to keep the collection mostly digital these days. Oh, okay. I don't live in upstate New York where I have a lot of room. So uh, the palace down exactly, here. Exactly. I have no palace. Look at your you you both you guys both have palaces. I have a very yeah. small room. You're literally in a, a closet bar right over now. there. If you no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's not our fault, man. You know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about DC and, and Marvel. Are there any independent comics that you uh, uh, that you want to discuss, that you like, uh, suggest people reading? Uh, Radiant Black started today. It's an image comic. Um, it has 
a little bit of a invincible vibe in that it's a, a young hero like discovering his powers and what he's going to do with them. Uh, I thought that was really, really terrific. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I think most of what Image publishes is excellent. I mean, and it's all over the place. Like if you want a horror book, they have it. If you want superheroes, they have that. Um, there's a really good Aftershock Aftershock comics book called uh, We Live um, about two kids trying to survive in a world that's about to end. Uh, it's crazy. The, the art's beautiful. Uh, the characters are, are really well fleshed out. Um, the first issue, like, I, I'm not going to say it, I cried, but I did get choked up in, in one of the scenes. How about you guys? Do you read a lot of indies? I, you know, I spend, uh, well, uh, even though I do live in upstate New York, <laughs> upstate, um, I still try to, you know, I, I collect most of my comics digitally. So I'll thumb through and just kind of look uh, what is out there that catches my eye on like comicsology. Um, there are a few things that I have, I've read through. Um, there's a comic and dude, I forget the, who actually publishes. I was trying to look it up, but um it's called Once in Future. Uh, and oh, yeah, basically yeah. it's, you know, a retelling or a modern uh, retelling of, kind of, of uh, King Arthur. So, but but this time around, uh, the King Arthur is, he's evil and uh, Merlin is evil. So uh, it's, it's a pretty, pretty good spin on the story and, you know, uh, pretty, violent in some cases but it, it pulls in a lot of other fictional characters like Grendel and and things like that so it's pretty good there's another one I read a couple of years ago uh and it's just at clearly it just off the wall bananas uh called Dr. shoot Dr. McNinja it was a black and white so comic uh just utter silliness very funny um you know it's the type of stuff that you know, along the lines of say, you know, Rick and Morty, that type of stuff. Um, very funny though, there's an omnibus version out uh, that you can get, it's, you know, relatively cheap. It's, it was like, um, like comic strip style and then compiled together. Uh, very funny though. And I think uh, it was black and white originally and then they colorized like later issues, uh, but good stuff. Well, you know my story. I, I don't collect anything past 1993. <laughs> That's my cutoff. But I mean, I remember for me, independent comics, my cousin, um, he he was always, I always thought he was cooler than me. He was my age, but he got, um, I remember he bought like Martial Law and um, what were some other ones? Grendel, like oh, Grendel from like uh, yeah. the darker one. And I remember reading these comics and you know, like John Sable Freelance and Badger and Nexus and all these things, Crossfire. And I was like, wow, I mean, there's more to life than Marvel and DC. And that kind of got me into those comics. And I thought it was always cool, the, the sort of the freedom they had. They didn't have to stay within certain parameters of older stories. They could spread out any way they like and say whatever they like. And uh, I always, you know, if I see a number one issue of uh, independent comics, you usually can't find more than one uh, in most bins. I try to pick it up just to see how some stories started, but I couldn't tell you anything about new comics. I rely on you guys for that. So what happened in 1993 that you decided to stop? So uh, 93, Iraq war. Um, it was a lot of the, the poly- Superman dying, you couldn't take it. Yeah. <laughs> it you was too up. much for me. So that, that kicked it off. Then I was uh, at boarding school and I was getting Amazing Spider-Man sent to me in the mail every month. I was reading it religiously. I had my wizard magazines. And uh, like you had said before, it, it was hard to be out as a comic fan and it was getting harder and harder. So I just had to sort of put it on hold and that sort of lasted for a while. And then, um, you know, about six years ago, my daughter started talking about superheroes and stuff. And I, that's like just the spark I needed to get right back in. <laughs> I'm like, I've missed the past 
20 some odd years, really. Like I know it's talking to you guys, what's sort of happened, but it'd be a lot for me to catch up on. So I'm like, I'll stick to what I'm familiar with and go back to the originals. And I just, I love the comics from the seventies and eighties. I just think there's so much creativity to them. Like, I don't think there's a bad comic as long as someone actually put their heart into it and put an idea they really cared for forward as dopey as it might've been. Um, like those books they showed you, those Dell books of Frankenstein and Dracula, the Wolfman, where they had, right. you know, Frankenstein waking up and taking a new identity and this millionaire leaves him a million dollars to fight crime. And I'm like, this is the worst book I've ever read. But man, I love how creative it is. Like who would think to do that to Frankenstein? Like you could have gone the regular route, but you said, let's make him a spy. Let's make him, you know, a spy who wears a mask. that looks like a normal person. And when he gets angry, he takes it off and he starts beating people up. Love it. That's my story. That's <laughs> <awesome>. <laughs> you would benefit from like Marvel Unlimited and uh, DC Infinite, I think it's called now. Uh, yeah. Just because they have so many comics on there. You I mean, you could spend probably the rest of your life catching Just up and reading them all. All right. Now, do you consider, because I know I've spoken to Ali about this and we'll have Ali on the show so viewers can see who the hell we're talking about. Excellent. I'll put a picture up of them so we can see. Yeah, Al Tarantino. Uh, new universe with Marvel in the 80s. They said, we're going to make comics that have nothing to do with anything we've done before. Um, didn't turn out very well because I, I think it was sort of a good idea and then people just sort of gave up on it internally. Uh, what were your thoughts on that? I mean, I remember reading a few of them. I star brand for sure. Right. And uh, was it side force? Something? Yeah. And then there's kickers incorporated and uh, a few other, it escapes me now. I have a bunch of them, but. It, yeah. It, I'm not sure why I didn't stick with it. I, I mean, I read more DC comics as a kid than Marvel, but mm -hmm. uh, I remember it launching um Star Brand in particular, I think I read the longest, but right. I don't remember. Was it in the 80s? It was in the 80s. Yeah, it was the mid 80s. Because I was going to say, I was going to ask you because, you know, not to give it away, you're a little bit older than us. But <laughs> damn it. <laughs> I mean, no, you're younger. Cut. <laughs> was it tough to find books besides Spider Man and Superman? You know, whatever the big books were, was it harder for you to find? books that might've been on the fringe, books, you know, like a new universe or titles that weren't as popular. Um, how did you find those? I mean, it's like, like I, I started out on newsstand. So then mm -hmm. that's where you're getting like the major ones, obviously, right. like all the major Marvel and DC stuff. But when I discovered the first, my first comic store in my neighborhood, like mm -hmm. they were ordering everything and everything back then isn't as much as everything now. Right. So, um, I think Forbidden Planet, when I first discovered that store uh, in the West Village, like that had more independent titles that I realized were out there. Right. Uh, and that was kind of incredible. And you also, you're sort of a staple on the Comic-Con scene. You know, you've uh, hosted events and interviews there. How has it changed from when you were a kid to where it is now, where it's almost impossible to get in? You have to get tickets a year in advance. And, you know, it's less about the comic books in some ways and more about autographs. Let's go, Pops. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't get Jason I'm, started on I'm that. feeling older and older as I talk to you guys. Uh, like, <laughs> I mean, you're exactly right. My first convention was at the Roosevelt Hotel uh, in Manhattan. You could just walk up. To it i think it was five dollars to get in uh there it wasn't a, a mob scene you could just mm -hmm. go and talk to any artist there they had original art pages that were probably the highest would be a hundred dollars if that right. uh and you compare that to, the, to today and like going to san diego uh, it's crazy i mean i'm happy that there's so many fans for all different aspects of this um i, I do like comic cons that the smaller ones that focus more on comics, like uh, San Diego and New York, is, that's sort of just like pop culture. And right. like, if I go into it knowing what the uh, what the theme and the approach is going to be, then I'm fine. Like, there's there's a nice 
there's a smaller con in Albany that uh, feels like the first con I went to where it's like cool toys, lots of dollar bins, like a lot of 70s and 80s comics that are like turning yellow from age. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's very low key. It's, it's a great show. Yeah. There was a Wizard World uh, comic convention years ago. It was right around the time of the regular, you know, uh, Big Apple Comic Con. Um, and it was, you know, right across the street from the Javits Center on the piers there. And, you know, I just remember it being, uh, it, was, it was fantastic. I mean, I literally spent all day there and you had, you had big name artists, uh, writers, celebrities, um, and not to mention, you know, all the other swag and, you know, people, uh, you know, celebrities taking pictures and all that sort of thing. Um, it was far less intimidating than any of those big comic book conventions. I mean, I still have yet to go to any of those. I would love to. God knows when we'll be able to do that again. But even so, it's, you know, it just being, you know, packed in like sardines in the Javits Center doesn't really appeal to me than doing that. But, you know, I guess I'm getting old. I would recommend uh, Baltimore Con and Terrific Con in Connecticut. There's Terrific Con, there. I would love to go to. I think yeah. Mark and I have discussed that in the past. And They're like mid-sized cons. They get, um, they actually get, especially Baltimore gets a slightly different group of creators than New York and San Diego get, which is also nice. That's all I got. Yeah, there you go. What is your... Um, you have an opinion on uh, kind of the state of comics going forward? What we, you know, do you think we're going in the right direction? Not we, but, you know, <laughs> comics uh, industry in general is kind of, is saturated or is there room for improvement or what have you? I just want more people to buy more comics. Like we were, I was talking to someone about this last week where uh, you guys are probably more familiar with this than I am, but there's a, a Dogman book that sold yes. like a million copies upon release. My daughter has them, yeah. And it's just like, I want comics to sell a million copies again. <laughs> like I want the people who are, who are seeing the TV shows, watching the cartoons and going to the movies to discover comics and keep buying them. And I don't know how you convert them to readers. On the flip side of that, just something I've asked before, but as a collector, how do you feel when these movies and these shows come out and suddenly a book that, you know, like we said before, was in a dollar bin is going for $30, $40 because there's speculation that somebody in the book might show up on a show and all of a sudden a book that you maybe wanted to fill, you know, for your collection is suddenly maybe out of your price range. Yeah, I, I mean, that's that sort of, I'm fascinated by the people who still buy like every number one, because if you look at the sales charts, obviously the number ones are like four times the sale of issue number two. And I always right. wonder like, who is buying all these comics? Um, I wish I had that kind of money. It's just like, <laughs> it seems like a crazy gamble. Invest in the stock market instead. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think, People had to have learned from the 90s that things do pop. Uh, you know, everyone who still has piles and piles of young blood and wildcats number one in their house, you know, hoping to retire on it. It's going to be a tough, uh, tough road for you. Right. <laughs> and those poly bag death of Superman issues. Yes. Hey, I still don't touch my what? You never know. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> We never had Joe walk off the set. Uh, oh. uh, no, no, go ahead. We'll Sorry. figure this out. We'll get it cut. Uh, who I ask of people this all the time. Do you have a Mount Rushmore of artists? Oh, that's a great question. Instead of four. Four artists? We want to go with. Oh, five. We'll go with five. I mean, yeah. George Perez is definitely number one. Um, I think it's that era. Like I would say uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez is there. I'm a big fan of Chuck Patton. Like his Justice League is 
It's like spot on uh, for me. That's three. Um, huh. All right. I want to I want to come back to the other two because those are the three that come to mind immediately. Who are yours? Ooh. I'll go first. Um, in no particular order. I, and I, 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 let me preface this by saying this. I think everyone would put Ditko and Kirby and, you know, the legends in it. So I want to, they have their own space. But for me, uh, Neil Adams, um, he, I think he's a workhorse. I don't think he gets appreciated at all. Ron Lim, I think he did a lot of great work. Um, Mike Zeck, I like a lot of his uh, artwork. Um, one guy who I really dug, uh, Mike Grell. Yep. Uh, John Sable, uh, Green Arrow. And I guess my fifth would be, hmm, gee whiz, Steve Rude's covers, man. Steve Rude's covers of Nexus. Um, I, I just remember being like, I've never seen anything in the world like this. Like they're beautiful paintings that happen to be of a superhero. Um, and I could still look at his art or, or the things that he's done. And I'm just like, this is an incredible talent. That's mine. What about you, Joe? Well, I'm really bad with names. And every time that you, you ask this question, I'm like feverishly trying to go through my head. But obviously, first off, Alex Ross. Alex I've Ross, that's Always right. been, he, you know, when we talk about, you know, jumping off points and things that got me into comics, Kingdom Come was one of the big, uh, you know, major stories that just absolutely fascinated me because even uh, Marvel's, you know, looking at the artwork, I was like, wow, this this guy painted all this stuff. I think he was even commissioned to do a whole wraparound of the Marvel's um, studio or the Marvel studio where it ever did all the characters um, individually. And then they put them together as a big giant office wrap. Um, I like Ethan Van Skyver who did, um, he, he did a lot of the artwork during Jeff John's run um, of Green Lantern. That's right. um, he really, I mean, just hit it out of the park. And like when you, when you think of Green Lantern, like his, you know, versions just pop into my head. Um, I do like, you know, Jim Lee's work. He does some really clean, crisp um, work. Um, oh, man. Yeah, George, uh, I was saying Perez, but apparently I've been saying it wrong. Um, and jeez, uh, I don't know. I'll come back to it. Maybe next time you ask it, I'll have a, a complete list, Orrin. Sorry. Jeez. Nicola Scott should be on that list too. Like her pencils are amazing. She did uh, Earth 2 during the New 52. She did the, uh, the Nightwing story for uh, Future uh, State. And she did those terrific... Uh, 80 year cover celebrations were with Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, like oh. the decades. Yeah. And a Nightwing one, where the last Nightwing, his ass is facing the reader to show off uh, his assets. Uh, yeah. Yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Glad I missed that one. <laughs> we'll send you that one. Oh, please. Like, I need a new poster over here. I'll put an image of it over all this, uh, you know. Yeah, people know what we're talking about. Right in my face. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. You should make it look like he has it all over his walls. You know, George. Oh yeah, just there we go. I'm trying to set up a background here that makes it. It's all fun. baseball stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's Mookie Wilson. I mean, my goodness. In my heart, the greatest man who ever lived. What can I say? Uh, just because we can always add this stuff around. Do you want us to give people your Twitter handle or just you want to leave that out? Yeah, sure. That's fine. It's just, it's George Jean Castines at Twitter, right? It's just George Castine, is it? Uh, oh, Castine, excuse me. It's, uh, I only use Jean for my byline because I, I want it extra pretensions. Uh, is there anything else you want to plug, George? No, no. I think, uh, I think this is it. I have, I'm working on like three pieces right now, which is causing me a little bit of stress because I was on vacation last week and I didn't do any writing. So uh, I got to get on the- Well, like you say, it's time to write. 
Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Are you and uh, the, uh, Bill Walco really working on your um, like the biography or, or you know? Or... Yeah, I, I don't even know what to call it yet, but um, right. I had. I had the notion of doing some sort of graphic novel memoir and I wanted to do a, a test pilot. Okay. So um, I get a lot of questions about like, I get a lot of pitches for comic cover coverage and people don't really get that it's not my full-time job right. and I don't have an automatic space. I don't have like a weekly column or anything. Right. So uh, we did a 10 page story that shows how uh, it goes from pitch to publication when I'm successful, obviously, uh, right. and all the steps in, in between. Um, it, it came out, he's Bill Walco. I'll put him on my Mount Rushmore because he's a genius. Yeah. Uh, his, his, his artwork just makes me smile and he's just a, such a great collaborator. Um, like I've never written a comic before. So I put together a reasonable script uh, but he was able to envision it in a way that I never could. And it, I'm, it just makes me ha happy whenever I, I look at the pages now. Well, I'm looking forward to that when it comes out. If it could turn into a coffee table, <laughs> yes. oh, that would be <laughs> Then you got, that's money in the bank. That's gold, Jerry. <laughs> a memoir that turns into a transformer. Do it. Yeah. Do it. Design me out here too. <laughs> Nicely done. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, for joining us on this second, technically, episode of uh, Dollar Bin Bandits. I'd like to thank George for uh, joining us. Um, Great to be as, here. It was it, very insightful, and I've wanted to pick your brain more about comics for a while now, and I'm glad we did so. Uh, Oren, as a pleasure, as always, to chat with you. Thank and, you, uh, Hope you guys come back again and uh, keep this train rolling along. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Have a good one, guys. Take care, y'all.